Welcome back, everyone, to the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast. I'm dermatologist and hair loss specialist, Dr. Jeff Donovan. I'm also the director of the Donovan Hair Academy. The Academy educates the public about hair loss, and we have training programs for hair loss practitioners as well. Hair loss affects all people around the world, and so we welcome all people to our programs. The Donovan Hair Academy runs the EBHF, or the Evidence-Based Hair Fellowship. The EBHF is the world's most comprehensive training program for hair loss specialists. Our EBHF graduates ultimately complete two years of very intensive training and are some of the best trained specialists in the world. The podcast that you're listening to right now is the official podcast of the Donovan Hair Academy. In this podcast, I review studies that are changing how we think about hair loss. I'll introduce them to you, help you make sense of them, and give you my thoughts on how a given study just might change how we diagnose or treat hair loss. And as a reminder, the podcast is for educational purposes and shouldn't be considered a substitute for medical advice. I very much enjoy offering the Evidence-Based Hair podcast. I enjoy being able to join you for our public webinars throughout the year and our ever-popular Question of the Week program. But before we begin today's podcast, I'd like to add that your support really makes a difference. And I thank all those who have supported us over the years. We have some very big goals for the next 10 and 20 years, not only in our podcasts and our webinars and our Question of the Week program and our training programs for healthcare practitioners, but in our multiple tireless efforts to ensure that the principles of evidence-based medicine will always be our guide in this most perplexing and complicated world of hair loss. If you'd like to learn more about our programs and projects that we're currently fundraising for, or to make a donation, please visit the Donovan Hair Academy at donovanhairacademy.com forward slash projects. And now on to our podcast. In today's episode, I'd like to talk about the safety of JAK inhibitors in pregnancy. Do you have patients with alopecia areata, for example, that are doing wonderfully and have regrown their hair and now have to make challenging decisions about when and how to stop these medications in the event that they're planning to become pregnant? Well, these are certainly issues that happen very often in my practice. And I really like this study published in Drug Safety titled Pregnancy Outcomes in Patients Treated with Upadacitinib, Analysis of Data from Clinical Trials and Post-Marketing Reports. A very practical study as we go about thinking about the possible safety issues related to JAK inhibitors in pregnancy. Well, we focus here on upadacitinib. Upadacitinib is not approved for alopecia areata, but certainly is used off-label for alopecia areata, as are many of the JAK inhibitors. There's only three JAK inhibitors that are approved for alopecia areata. But upadacitinib is a JAK inhibitor that's prescribed for a variety of inflammatory disorders. This includes rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, atopic dermatitis, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's, ankylosing spondylitis, and other conditions as well. And upadacitinib is certainly used in the hair loss clinic. It's used in alopecia areata, and there are many prior studies regarding the use of upadacitinib in the treatment of alopecia areata. And I have several patients on upadacitinib, especially patients with atopic dermatitis and alopecia areata. Upadacitinib is approved for atopic dermatitis, and it's approved for patients 12 years of age and over over with refractory atopic dermatitis. And so when you have patients that are 12 and over with atopic dermatitis that is highly refractory to treatments, and they just happen to have alopecia areata as well, well, upadacitinib is certainly on the list as an important consideration. But JAK inhibitors have to be stopped during pregnancy, and that is certainly the advice of all the monographs, there is a potential risk to the fetus if they are exposed to JAK inhibitors during pregnancy. And this includes studies showing skeletal abnormalities and cardiovascular anomalies. 
And so all JAK inhibitors advise the cessation of JAK inhibitors about a month before trying to become pregnant. And that includes not only pregnancy, but breastfeeding as well. But all of the companies that make JAK inhibitors, as well as clinicians around the world, are very interested to understand the safety of JAK inhibitors in pregnancy. And many of the big companies have set up databases to really try to understand the safety of these products in pregnancy. And it's certainly a area that the companies that make these JAK inhibitors are very, very, very interested in understanding. And some of the companies are very strict that JAK inhibitors are not to be used. And other companies have used language that has been more towards the view of we're not sure. And so if patients do become pregnant, let us know and we'd like them to enter in our database. But right now, my recommendation and the recommendation of most companies is that JAK inhibitors are not to be used during pregnancy and they must be stopped one month before pregnancy. So the purpose of this study in drug safety was to review pregnancy outcomes of patients that were exposed to JAK inhibitors, specifically upadacitinib, in pregnancy. And this includes data from clinical trials and data from post-marketing reports. And so we'll take a look at this study and we'll take a look at data from clinical trials of patients that were exposed to apatacitinib in their pregnancy. What were the outcomes? Did they give birth to healthy babies? Were there any abnormalities? Were there any organ anomalies that occurred? And then we'll take a look at post-marketing data of patients that had become pregnant while using a JAK inhibitor. Again, what were the outcomes for the fetus or baby? Let's begin with clinical trial data. In the clinical trial data, these authors share with us that there are 80 pregnancies that were identified from clinical trial data with known outcomes. And the age range of patients who became pregnant was 27 to 33 years, and there were patients with rheumatoid arthritis. That was the main group of patients that was studied with upadacitinib abuse, but there was psoriatic arthritis, non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis, atopic dermatitis, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's. And of these 80 pregnancies in the clinical trials, 54% of them were live births without congenital anomalies including two premature births and one with neonatal complications, 24 with spontaneous abortions, 21% with elective terminations, and one with 1% 1 with ectopic pregnancy. And only one live birth had a congenital anomaly, and that was a 35-week-old infant with an atrial septal defect. And what's important to recognize as you review data about anomalies and malformations in newborns is that a certain proportion of humans have congenital malformations and anomalies um, in the world. And so depending on the study that you read, a certain percentage, 1%, 2% of all newborns in the world have some sort of anomaly, and in some studies it's higher. And so that's important for us to be aware of, because if we look at pregnancy outcomes of uh, babies that have received medications in utero, their mothers received medications, and those babies have a certain percentage of anomalies, we have to ask, is that percentage higher than the general population, the same as the general population, or lower? Because we expect one to 2% of babies to have some sort of abnormality. And the conclusion of this study in those 80 pregnancies was that adverse pregnancy outcomes, such as spontaneous abortions, were not higher than that would be expected in the general population, nor in what would be expected of patients with autoimmune inflammatory diseases. So that's really important because this data suggests that 
these women receive dupatacitinib at some point in their pregnancy, and there did not appear to be an increase in abnormalities in their newborns. It's important to remember that the exposure in these clinical trials was very short. Mothers did not use upatacitative during the entire pregnancy. The duration was five weeks and three days on average. And so in these clinical trials, if a mother became pregnant, she was required to stop the medication. And then a decision was made on um, what to do next. But as a stipulation in being part of the clinical trial, women were not allowed to continue the upatacitinib through to term. And so the exposure of the um, fetus and infant ranged from two days to 19 weeks and five days. There was two pregnancies in this clinical trial data that had exposure beyond um, the first trimester. And both of those pregnancies resulted in live births without congenital anomalies. Now, what about the post-marketing data? Women who had exposure to a PAD sedative uh, and were not part of a clinical trial, but just in a post-marketing evaluation of upadacitinib safety. Well, there was 48 pregnancies that were identified, 26 with rheumatoid arthritis and the remaining with psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, atopic dermatitis, ulcerative colitis. And these 48 pregnancies include included 46% with oat congenital anomalies, 38% with spontaneous abortions, 15% with elective terminations, and 2% with ectopic pregnancies. And these authors reported 22 live births without any congenital anomaly, of which the majority were full term and had no neonatal complications. There were three premature infants born before 37 weeks. And um, the vast majority of patients reported maternal exposure to hepatocytinib in the first trimester. And there was a few patients where the timing wasn't clear. But overall, the conclusion was that in this very valuable study, there was no evidence of teratogenicity for pregnancies that had exposure to hepatocytinib in the first trimester. Now, again, the exposure was of relatively short duration, but it was in the first trimester. And that is, of course, the trimester where organs are developing or organogenesis is occurring. There were a few that had exposure in the first trimester and into the second trimester as well, but it was very limited. But again, this was not exposure throughout the entire pregnancy. But the data is limited. And so definitive conclusions can't be drawn about the safety of upadacitinib in pregnancy. And certainly the general recommendation will continue to be that these medications for now must be stopped in any woman who is planning to become pregnancy. And these are challenging decisions. You know, I have many patients who are doing fantastic on JAK inhibitors and they are trying to decide when to time their pregnancy. And these are challenging decisions. These are emotional decisions. And data is very much needed. And of course, we want to ensure that babies are safe. We want to ensure mothers are safe. And so these are very important questions in our field. And there's no doubt that we'll be getting more and more data about the use of JAK inhibitors in pregnancy. This includes not only data in the first trimester, but exposure throughout the entire pregnancy. And the companies that make these JAK inhibitors really, really, really want to know this information. This is an incredibly important goal for them. And so you will see these databases being set up for evaluation of pregnancy outcomes in women exposed to JAK inhibitors. And do pay attention to the monographs. They differ in different countries in terms of the strictness of the wording. Some wording has been very clear. Do, do not become pregnant while on a JAK inhibitor. And other wording is we don't advise it or we are not sure of the outcomes. And if you do become pregnant, you know, um, have a discussion with your physician and consider entering your data in a database. So the data, the monographs do differ in different countries, but 
right now, the message is pretty clear that we do not understand the safety well enough of these drugs in pregnancy, and women should stop, stop one month before. These drugs generally have a half-life of 8 to 14 hours, and so you know, stopping four weeks before will ensure that it's out of the body. Of course, it's probably out of the body well before that, but those are the recommendations to stop at least four weeks before becoming pregnancy. It's very reasonable to assume that drugs like uh, these JAK inhibitors cross the placenta, and that's certainly true for tofacitinib. And we have to assume these drugs uh, get to the baby, and it's certainly very clear that these drugs get into breast milk. And uh, we have to be aware that these drugs are not recommended for uh, mothers who are breastfeeding. And so in conclusion, this data suggests that women exposed to upadacitinib during the first trimester did not seem to have adverse pregnancy outcomes that was any higher than what would be expected in the general population or in women with autoimmune diseases. We can't draw much conclusions yet, but it certainly is encouraging that these JAK inhibitors uh, need more study and may have may have reasonable safety. But again, we, we need more studies. There was one report of an atrial septal defect out of these 43 live births in the clinical trial data. Again, we do expect a certain proportion of malformations and anomalies in newborn human beings. And more study will be needed, whether that is a um, related or unrelated phenomenon. And clearly, if we have a consistent appearance of atrial septal defects, then one would have to worry that this was related, but we have no reason to believe that this would be related at the present time, but we do need more study. But there's no evidence that's clear of teratogenicity, and I think this is a very valuable study, a very large study. And so I, I look forward to following this field. And what about other JAK inhibitors? Well, there's certainly limited data in the literature about other JAK inhibitors like tofacitinib, baricitinib, abrocitinib during pregnancy. And tofacitinib has been around the, long, long, the longest. So you can imagine we have some interesting data out there about the use of tof tofacitinib in pregnancy. And women that use tofacitinib do occasionally have fetal abnormalities, but it doesn't appear to be at a rate that's any higher than the general population. And again, most women in early trials have been recommended to stop tofacitinib if they become pregnant. And so these, the clinical trials are very clear that if you're in a clinical trial and become pregnant, the drug must be stopped. A very nice study published in Inflammatory Bowel Diseases in 2018 was titled Outcomes of Pregnancies with Maternal and Paternal Exposure in the Tofacitinib Safety Databases for ulcerative colitis. I really like this study. It studied 25 cases of pregnancy, 11 maternal exposures to tofacitinib and 14 paternal exposures to, fo to tofacitinib in patients with ulcerative colitis. The most common outcome was a healthy newborn. There was no fetal deaths, neonatal deaths, or congenital malformations reported in this 2018 study, there were two spontaneous abortions and two medical terminations. Now, what about the use of JAK inhibitors in the second and third trimesters? Now, the first trimester is really important. That is the trimester of organogenesis. And so there, in the field of neonatal medicine, in the field of fetal maternal medicine, we're very much concerned about the first trimester because that's when the organs are forming. And there's a difference in the thinking that goes on in the second and, and third trimester. That is when the organs have formed and are maturing and enlarging, and they're very different. And so we have some data suggesting that, okay, if, if mothers are exposed to JAK inhibitors in the first trimester, there are anomalies that occur, but it doesn't seem that it's really related to the drug so far. Well, what about the second and third trimester? Well, a very interesting study by Rowan and colleagues in 2024 was published titled Tofacitinib as a Rescue Therapy for Ulcerative Colitis in Pregnancy. I really like this study. It's a very unique study of a woman who, was, who used tofacitinib in the second and third trimester and had a healthy newborn. 
And so this was a woman using tofacitinib as a rescue treatment. She had ulcerative colitis that flared in pregnancy, and the only way that she could quiet down the ulcerative colitis was by using tofacitinib. It was a 28-year-old woman, and she was pregnant for the first time. She had a five-year history of pancolitis, and it was treated with ustekinumab. And early in her pregnancy, she had an exacerbation of her ulcerative colitis. She was treated with steroids, 5-ASA suppositories, but her ulcerative colitis, her bowel disease, did not improve. And so she was prescribed tofacitinib, 10 milligrams twice daily in the second trimester. In addition to these drugs, she had Shingrix for shingles, she had low-dose aspirin for preeclampsia prevention, she had tinziparin to address thrombotic risks. And throughout her pregnancy, her maternal and fetal health was closely monitored and she had very close follow-ups with her specialists. And by the 34th week of her pregnancy, she had a remission of her bowel disease without the use of corticosteroids. And her ultrasounds in pregnancy showed that the fetus was developing normally. And the baby was born by C-section, cesarean section at 39 weeks. And it was a healthy baby, 2,920 grams with no congenital issues. And it wasn't, there was no need to admit the baby to the intensive care unit. There were some challenges after delivery. There was some COVID-19 that occurred. There was uh, mastitis that occurred. However, the patient was able to maintain her remission for ulcerative colitis. So a really interesting study, this Rowan et al. study of a woman who used tofacitinib in the second and third trimester and maintained quiescence of her autoimmune disease and gave birth to a healthy baby. Now, these are challenging. Clearly, these cases are really important additions to our literature and these cases need to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. If we have patients with autoimmune diseases that are flaring in their pregnancy, do they use drugs like JAK inhibitors or not? Well, this Rowan et al. study will certainly be quoted many, many times in those situations. But it is a single case report, and clearly we need more studies on how JAK inhibitors affect maternal and fetal health. And in addition, how tofacitinib and JAK inhibitors transfer to breast milk. That's very clear that it does. And finally, I want to just mention one more study about baricitinib. We talked about upadacitinib. We talked about tofacitinib. Let me mention a word or two about baricitinib. I really liked, I really liked a study by Constanzo et al., Baricitinib exposure during pregnancy in rheumatoid arthritis, a study in 2020. It was a very intriguing report about baricitinib exposure in pregnancy. We have tofacitinib, we have upadacitinib. This was a 43-year-old woman with rheumatoid arthritis who became pregnant on baricitinib. She was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis at age 25 and initially her condition was treated with methotrexate, but later it was paired with etanercept, a TNF inhibitor. But this treatment didn't seem to work for her, and so she was then treated with adalimumab and sertilizumab. These had adverse effects, and she was then started on the JAK inhibitor baricitinib. We know baricitinib very well. We, it is an FDA-approved treatment as well for alopecia areata one of the three currently approved treatments. Well, in the fifth month of this woman's baricitinib treatment, she noticed that she missed her period and pregnancy was confirmed. And it was felt that, uh, and it was concluded that she had been exposed to baricitinib for several weeks prior to conception and throughout the first trimester up until about the 17th week of pregnancy. The patient's baricitinib was halted and the rheumatoid arthritis was effectively managed with corticosteroids. Fetal growth remained normal throughout the pregnancy, and ultrasound exams revealed no significant abnormalities. And the infant was delivered at term without any complications for either the mother or the baby. And the baby had a healthy weight and length, had normal growth and psychomotor development up until the ninth month so far of monitoring. 
So another interesting study of JAK inhibitor exposure in the first trimester and early second trimester. And the immediate cessation of the drug leading to a healthy outcome for both mother and baby. And so this case too adds to our growing body of data about the use of JAK inhibitors in pregnancy. I think it's important to keep this data in mind that it is fascinating, but we still don't know all the answers. And the recommendation continues to be that JAK inhibitors be stopped one month before planning a pregnancy. Will those recommendations stay? Hard to say, but uh, I look forward to following this field very closely. And I assure you that the drug companies that make these JAK inhibitors are very, very interested in this question. And these databases are forming around the world. And so if you do have patients that um, do become pregnant on these JAK inhibitors, it'll be important to um, contact um, these companies as well, if, if the patient is so agreeable to uh, have their data entered. But um, these are very important questions. And this data so far is very encouraging that there could be um, reasonable safety. But these are tough questions. There is no time whereby thrombosis risk is increased than in pregnancy. And a worry in studies has been for years the possible risk of blood clots with JAK inhibitors. Now, that data, of course, has been mostly in our rheumatoid arthritis literature, but uh, we have not seen that in our alopecia areata studies to that degree. But clearly, that is one big question about women using JAK inhibitors in pregnancy, as well as risks of infection and other things. But these studies have suggested that the safety was was quite good. And so these are these are tough questions. And for now, I continue to have to advise patients to stop JAK inhibitors before they go ahead and plan their pregnancies. And that can be very challenging because some patients do absolutely lose hair with the cessation of JAK inhibitors. You need to stop a JAK inhibitor one month before planning a pregnancy. And of course, pregnancy doesn't occur in the first month of trying. It can take some women many months. And what happens with cessation of JAK inhibitors for many months? Well, you lose hair. And it's devastating. And so these are very, very important questions for our patients with alopecia areata who uh, use these JAK inhibitors, achieve wonderful growth in a good proportion of patients, and then must stop them and then must uh, experience the hair loss that comes with stopping. These are lifelong treatments for many, many people. So I thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you'll join me next week when we'll tackle another important question about pregnancy treatments, and that is the use of difenciprone or DPCP in pregnancy, a fascinating study in JAD case reports from April 2024 titled The Use of Difenciprone for Alopecia Areata Treatment During Pregnancy. Thank you so much for joining me for today's podcast. It's my belief that education and educational endeavors like this podcast can help clinicians acquire new knowledge, which can ultimately help patients. And education can also help hair loss researchers to ask better research questions. And better research questions can give clear answers about how to best diagnose or how to best treat hair loss. And ultimately, this will see benefit in our patients with hair loss. And education can also empower patients to acquire new knowledge so that they can engage in critical discussions with their hair loss practitioners, which hopefully will lead to improved care. At the Academy, we're really proud to be able to offer educational programs for clinicians, as well as educational programs for the public. And if you're a practitioner interested in studying hair loss at an advanced level, you might consider applying to the Evidence-Based Hair Fellowship, or EBHF. This is an intense program, but it's a program that equips you with the necessary skills to really help patients. Our next iteration starts January 2026, and we'd love to have you in the program. You can learn more about the EBHF by contacting our administrators at info at Donovan 
hairacademy.com. That's it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next week for another episode of the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast. Thanks so much.